Yes, start actually right there by saying, I'm Samantha Davidson Green, and I am here as um, Executive Director of JAM, which is our new name for CATV as we expand into new roles in the community hosting in-person events. Um, this is our new space where we are having media arts exhibits, uh, youth programs, adult media education workshops. So I want to just point out to you um, the cards here. Feel free to grab one. Our new website, uvjam.org, has a bunch of ongoing um, workshops and uh, a film contest coming up. Um, we're having an opening on Saturday here. Uh, media artist Carla Kimball has an installation piece. There will be live dance, live music, um, integrated with uh, a projection experience with hanging panels, and it should be really um, beautiful and interesting. Um, I want to ask uh, if anybody has any concern about being recorded. We, I'm using this because we're recording it to share with the community. We manage two channels that are committed to Upper Valley content. So um, if you have any concern about being on, just let me know afterwards and we'll make sure that you're not um, visible. Um, but I want to welcome Matt, and I'm going to let Marion do the official thing because sh she's really the host of this. Um, and we're so grateful to have AIM up here in the space. Um, it's a real coming together for me of a lot of things because Matt's been my friend since childhood and inspiration and always and has so much to do with our being here in White River Junction with such a thriving art scene. Um, you just make, make things happen wherever you go, and we're all such beneficiaries of that. So we're thrilled to have you. Thanks. Thanks, Samantha. I'm going to keep it super short. Um, welcome, everybody. And if you're watching at home, aimup.coffee, and you can find out about our next meeting. But Matt Dunn has offered to come and join us and talk about what it takes to build a thriving business in a rural economy. And for our group, Aim Up, which is, we say, creative entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial creatives. And we're really about this place where business, creativity, and community meet. So um, I'm not going to go into a long introduction, but thank you, Matt. Great. Thank you. I, oh, and I don't need that because I've got this thing. You've got your own lovelier. How about that? Turn that off. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you for having me, and thank you for being accommodating of schedules that uh, <laughs> dealt with our uh, late introduction to COVID. I think it was the first one, and then uh, my senior in high school's visit to colleges. Uh, delayed coming together, but so glad to be here. Uh, Samantha, I'm delighted to be in your beautiful space and also inspired by the work that you're doing. I, mean, I, I can't tell you how lucky we are as an Upper Valley that uh, Samantha made a decision that uh, enough of Brooklyn and came on home to be able to drive uh, vision here. And this is just so exciting to see that. So, um, and we have known each other since we were 13, which is a, a lovely uh, trajectory and, and friendship. Um, and, uh, and it's great to be in the space. Um, as, as some of you may know, I was very involved in the uh, White River Junction revitalization efforts uh, uh, before it was known as the uh, Brooklyn of Vermont. Uh, and uh, there, was, there was a time in uh, 1989 where there was a brand new fledgling uh, equity theater company that was trying to make it happen in the Briggs Opera House, and they hired me as their uh, one and only paid intern uh, to be in four shows, do all the props, uh, actually build the cable uh, to be able to hang the lights and screw in the seats that I think are still in the Briggs Opera House today. Um, and from that point on, I became a, an advocate and, and somewhat of an addict of the potential and revitalization of White River, uh, working on everything from the uh, founding board of the White River Film, uh, Indie Film Festival to uh, helping to uh, attract the uh, Northern Stage to come in and take over the Opera House. I ran it for a couple of years because folks saw me as having more uh, energy than sense. Uh, and then, um, uh, and then the Center for Cartoon Studies and uh, convincing uh, James and Michelle that Minneapolis is a terrible place to start an MFA program in cartooning and White River would be perfect and uh, to come on over uh, and to, to make it happen here uh, and, and working with Matt Boosie and others. This space in particular has some meaning because uh, it was empty after J.J. Newberry's left and this was before the the Tucker box or even the predecessor uh, had come in. It was just huge space. And so David Fairbanks Ford and I decided 
um, that we really needed uh, to have some dance parties in downtown White River in the mid-90s. So we tore it all out, we painted it, uh, we took down the fake ceilings, and we had uh, four epic, if money losing, uh, dance parties uh, here. Um, and it, it was all part of what I think was the key to White River Junction, which was that there, in, in many ways, was no plan. There was not a master view of what was going to happen in some order or one person in charge. There was an incredibly collaborative uh, group of creative types that were generous and wanted to work together and would volunteer and try things, even if they seemed uh, a little uh, nutty at the time, including when Matt Boosies told me that he bought the Tip Top building for the taxes that were owed. And I was like, really? What are you going to do with it? He said, I'll figure it out. Uh, and, and here we are today. And it's, um, it's just been exciting to watch that uh, evolution take place and the creative uh, economy work that, that happened uh, in this interesting and organic way. Um, as some of you also know, I, was, uh, I, I had a, a, a political uh, trajectory at different times being in the House and the Senate. And, it, and in many ways, my inspiration for the economic development policy work that I did in the legislature came from right here. It was, you know, asking the question, why are those dilapidated buildings over on the other side of the railroad tracks standing empty? And it turned out it was because they were contaminated. And no one wanted to touch them. And I said, well, how do you get to the place where someone would be willing to redevelop them? They said, well, you have to deal with the liability for that contamination. And that led to the first Brownfields legislation in the state of Vermont. The same was true for many of the downtown buildings that no one was willing to do anything above the first floor. And they said, because it's cost prohibitive to actually do the sprinkling and the other uh, fire safety work in those areas. And it makes more economic sense to build on Sykes Avenue. And so we introduced the downtowns program, uh, which has continued to this day, that has allowed for uh, tax credits and other uh, resources to be able to allow that kind of redevelopment uh, to happen. And again, it wasn't uh, you know, one person uh, coming up with you know, brilliant policy ideas. It was a community identifying challenges, and I had the good fortune to be um, in Montpelier and hanging out here and being able to listen to people to say, oh, how might we? And folks being able to be creative and figuring that out. And so it's been a, it, it, my, my, um, my, my work uh, has definitely been inspired by White River. And in some ways, the trajectory of White River has made me feel like it's doing fine. It's okay. And let's see if we can take those experiences uh, that we found here and see if we can share it with communities um, that haven't had that kind of a, a, a renaissance, um, that have not, and are also not as fortunate White River, um, even though, for those of you who may have seen it in the early 90s, it was rough. Uh, and a, there was a tunnel that went under, I don't know if you know this, under the tracks where people uh, lived um, or large chunks of the year, um, and it was, it was just rough. Uh, but we were, we, what, what our goal was was to say, um, you know, we've got Hanover, we've got Woodstock, we've got New London. There's got to be some people who want something more edgy than what Hanover has to offer. Exactly. Let's create that. Uh, and so we did, and, and that's really what the energy was, and it was so much fun to be uh, a part of that in a, um, uh, in a, in a interesting and creative way. By the way, if you haven't had Matt Busey do a presentation, I would highly recommend it. His, um, he, he comes with, at least the ones that I've done with him, I would do like the earnest you know, policy thing, and he came with uh, 400 slides that he had randomly mixed up that told the story of the revitalization of White River and how he was involved, but they were, again, randomly assorted, so he would just plunk through them, and it's the most brilliant presentation I've ever seen. Uh, but um, uh, that brings me to the, to the work that I'm, I'm doing now. Uh, so the Center on Rural Innovation uh, was founded in uh, 2017, uh, and for me it was about uh, how address the uh, really, really intense 
challenge that we're facing as a country, uh, which is the economic divide between urban and rural places, which has become more pronounced than it's been in a, in a hundred years. And uh, a hundred years ago, there was the huge transition from uh, farming to manufacturing, uh, where farming automated at an epic, epic level, uh, and people moved to cities in search of employment, that manufacturing was starting to grow, uh, and they were starting to you know, work in those manufacturing uh, positions. But there was a big divide, there was a big um, uh, depression, uh, and a lot of the policies that came out of that, whether it was rural electrification or a lot of the training programs or other kinds of things, were about making sure that there was an equitable economy uh, across the country. Well, we come to a similar inflection point. And in 2008, uh, during the Great Recession, uh, everyone fell at a pretty significant level, uh, and the difference was how communities recovered. Uh, urban places came roaring right back, rural places not so much, that even by January of 2020, when, uh, before COVID hit, not even half of all rural counties had gotten back to their pre-2008 level. Uh, COVID hit, everyone fell, rural fell further, and the recovery that we've seen today has continued to see urban places shooting right up, rural places coming up, but at a very gradual pace. So if you get to the core of it, uh, what, what happened around 2008 was also a massive acceleration in automation. And when you have a economic shock like that, there is an acceleration because people need to figure out how to deliver goods and services cheaper. Uh, and so there was automation in general of, the, um, of, of plant operations and traditional uh, rural industries. There was also globalization facilitated through technology where you no longer needed to have your manufacturing plant in a rural place that you could get to relatively quickly by plane or, or, or car, uh, you could do it anywhere in the world. And you could transfer those kinds of, of rapid prototyping types of um, files very, very quickly. And the other was the decline of entrepreneurship in rural places that had been pronounced in the 30 years prior to 2008. And if you don't have the farm team of new companies that are coming with new ideas, when something like that happens, you end up uh, not having uh, the, the, the new enterprises coming in when some go away uh, to take their place. And so between uh, you know, 2008 and, and 2000, uh, the jobs that were created in the US were almost exclusively from companies that were less than 10 years old. And the major drivers of those new jobs and the higher paying jobs were almost exclusively technology. And those jobs, uh, almost 97% of them, took place in cities. So you end up with that differentiation, uh, and you, you, you get what I think we all witnessed, uh, which was a massive decline uh, in rural economies in a quiet way, where populations went down, uh, the number of um, uh, total jobs uh, decreased dramatically. You then had follow-on impacts of things like uh, newspapers and television stations folding en masse. You have hospitals in crisis because the payer mix has become uh, unsustainable in most rural places. Uh, and you had uh, deaths of despair, um, whether from opioids or from suicides, go up in ways that we just haven't seen. So you take those all together, um, you throw some politics into it and you get the divisions that we've seen in this country. Uh, and I, I remember, uh, actually, Andy, you and I had coffee as I was saying, all right, since my little uh, foray, in, foray into state politics didn't work out in 2016, um, trying to figure out what I could do next to make a difference in the universe. Uh, and I had coffee with lots and lots of different people, including Ryan, as, as we were talking about blockchain and other kinds of things. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the, the passion that I had was about creating economic opportunity, ideally through uh, mechanisms that can create on-ramps for all kinds of people and learners, and ones that can be transformational quickly.
because we don't have a lot of time to be able to, uh, to, to make this change happen um, if it is a core, as I do think it is, um, to the, some of the divisions we have currently uh, in our nation. Uh, so we got this organization off the ground. Uh, I tapped into my experience in the 90s where outside of the legislative work and other things, I worked for a software company that was founded by you know, two Dartmouth guys that was based in Wilder, Vermont, uh, that served the commercial printing industry. And that was, that was what I did. And so obviously you could do tech in rural. Why, why not? Uh, I got to experience it firsthand. Um, and when I, uh, I was recruited to work for Google in 2007, and I refused to move, uh, and so they let me open an office in White Ridge Junction, and if you go to the second floor, the tip top, it's, it's still there. Uh, and, uh, and so this notion that you could actually build tech economy jobs in rural places, the ones that were the, are the fruits of automation and provide the greatest opportunity for economic mobility, seemed obvious, right? Of course, we need to get out there and, and do the work to make that happen. Um, but what I wasn't anticipating was the incredible narrative pushback uh, that had emerged over that time. Oddly, during the time I was working from White River for Google all across the globe, there had become this view that you needed to have an agglomeration of people. You needed to have a minimum of a million people in one place in order to create a tech company that could be successful. And that had gotten into the minds of venture capitalists, of economists. Uh, and as I was going around starting to work on how we build this organization to help with communities to uh, develop uh, digital uh, tech economy ecosystems, uh, I, I heard folks saying, well, you know, no one wants to live in rural places anymore. So why don't you just help them shut down kindly? Oh my God! I mean, that, I I heard that from more than one person, and uh, you know, albeit I was in San Francisco and New York City, but it it um, reinforced to me the myopia that was out there and the complete misunderstanding of both the uh, sources of the divide, which they were reinforcing where those might be coming from, but also the misunderstanding of rural life, rural community. Uh, the sustainability that can happen living in a rural place rather than being stacked on top of one another, uh, as well as the unbelievable talent and entrepreneurship, I think that comes from uh, a, a rural experience, um, which is just, just different. And that's whether you've lived there your whole life or you have moved there because you have decided that you don't need to have everything immediately at your fingertips, that you can be a part of a larger community that needs to work together outside of formal job descriptions to be able to do things, um, and that that can be important. So, yeah. I have two questions. Sure, go I ahead. Don't, I, wanna, I don't want to let you, if you have a thought to finish. Go, why don't you go ahead, and then okay. I can talk so, about how we get started. So, one of them is just this idea of, you know, the, the value that you're talking about that rural entrepreneurs oh, bring, yeah. among other things, is, is community, right, and that um, integration and mm -hmm. interdependence. And one of the concerns that a lot of people have now with remote work is that uh, everybody is now working, you know, in a rural economy, but they're connected somewhere else as opposed to locally. Yeah. So that's, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, and then related to that is what you found, <laughs> I'm just about done, what you found that, um, that works well, because I think that would be really helpful for people to hear as well. Yeah, so the big question is that, um, you know, COVID, accelerated the movement to remote work in a breathtaking way. I mean, it, it was not in our plan, right, when we started this in 2007, but it is, um, it's, I mean, COVID had some horrific impacts, but it also had some interesting changes. Um, and I would say the most positive one was that it opened people's aperture to where work can take place, to where innovative people can be found. Um, all the way through to uh, where investments can be made in early stage uh, scalable companies. And so that, that's been an interesting thing to watch. But as, as you pointed out, and I'll repeat it a little bit in case it didn't get picked up by the mic, is um, that it also meant people moving to rural places uh, and, but working in isolation in those rural places. And one of the things that I say consistently um, when I do talks like this is, 
you know, Zoom town is not community. And it's really important as we emerge from whatever phase of the pandemic we are in to be thinking intentionally about how to bring folks together. Uh, and this is why uh, spaces that are community oriented, whether it's this or the Black River Innovation Campus that we uh, helped to stand up in Springfield, which is a co-work and innovation hub and recording studio area, uh, are so important because you need to figure out how to now invite the folks who came here in order to get away, to have a change of lifestyle, um, to be able to connect with one another, to realize that there is a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, because what's been seen in, uh, in, in research, um, whether in a technology company workplace or otherwise, is that virtuous collisions are incredibly powerful. They are the moments where you don't expect to meet someone who has a, you know, a, an idea um, that you've been thinking about as well, but comes with a different skill set that sparks something that then turns into a new product, a new creation, uh, a new community center, whatever it is. Uh, and it's very hard to do that online. Now, there are opportunities to be connected to folks all over the world, and I think that is, that is a gift and a blessing. But I, I'm, I'm a big believer in that in-person connection, in that ability to find ideas, to have whatever those chemical moments are to allow for uh, greater trust, um, as well as uh, sparking things that I don't think we completely understand um, to be able to move forward. So uh, I'm just getting back a little bit to how we got to the Center on Rural Innovation is that we started with a pilot in Springfield, Vermont, uh, which many of you hopefully are familiar with, uh, had been the um, uh, machine tool capital of the world, highest per capita income in the state of Vermont for 40 years uh, until machine tools started leaving and then it left really for good. There's, there's some vestiges of it there, but really for good in 2000 and the community just cratered. A prime example of an overdependence on a single industry uh, and not being in a position for resilience uh, when Massive shifts uh, happen like that. Uh, so, uh, but but it also had the good fortune of having uh, gotten a Obama era grant uh, to build a gigabit speed internet to every home and building uh, in 2011. The, the problem was, which by the way is the fastest internet in the world. Like you 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 can't get that kind of speed to a home anywhere else in the country. Uh, and in fact, you can get. 10 gigabit uh, connectivity. Um, it, nobody knew about it, right? And uh, so our job was to figure out how do we leverage that in order to create uh, a new kind of economy. And so working with uh, Bob Flint, who's the economic development director for the uh, Springfield region uh, and other uh, instigators, we raised about $2 million uh, to be able to stand up a tech accelerator co-workspace uh, an innovation hub in a former uh, high school building, um, which is just a stunning space. Um, still, still a long way to go in that redevelopment, but um, we were able to stand up a, a community center to be able to do this work. Um, COVID made that complicated as we were getting it off the ground, as you could probably imagine. We actually took a, a field trip down there. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, good, good. So you've seen, you've seen, seen, the, seen the space, seen the sp potential. Yeah. Um, and, and that uh, it was an interesting jumping off point for us um, because we knew we wanted to get the pilot up and rolling, but we also uh, believed that one rural innovation hub on its own would be unlikely to be successful because in this early stage, it's, uh, there isn't the deal flow to be able to attract larger investors, and there isn't the talent flow to be able to get larger employers to be willing to look to say, all right, I need five JavaScript folks that I want to work in a team, maybe I could find them in a, a single community to work out of a co-work space and, and still have that synergy, but find talent elsewhere. Um, but out of our work in Springfield, uh, we were noticed by the Economic Development Administration and they provided us with a contract to try to see if we could do that same kind of work in other world places. Uh, as part of that $2 million raise, we received a, a $750,000 grant from the EDA uh, Build to Scale program, 
uh, and we were the only completely rural place in the country to receive their signature grant that's supposed to be supporting tech innovation and entrepreneurship. And they said, that's a problem for us because they saw the same statistics we did, which was you know, urban places taking off in those areas and rural not so much. And they said, we might be contributing to the problem. It was a pretty interesting observation. Uh, and so they gave us a contract to start to work with other communities uh, to do that um, kind of strategy development, putting together the resources, figuring out a plan to make it happen. Um, and they thought we were going to have to go and like literally knock on doors of communities across the country. Uh, and, but we sent out an email, we had some partners who sent out emails, and we got 120 applications for seven slots. So we're like, huh, okay, there, there is a thing here that's happening. Uh, we had to narrow it down. Um, and their, only, their other condition was we couldn't do another one in Vermont because they were wanting to prove that this could be a national thing. So we, we started working with amazing places like Traverse City, Michigan, and Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and, uh, and Wilson, North Carolina, that had all made a similar decision, that they needed to build a tech economy um, but they didn't know exactly how, and they assumed they were completely by themselves. They were being told by their local city councils that they were, they were crazy. Uh, they had you know, investors who were like, what are you talking about? This is not what rural people do. And they were forging ahead anyway. And so we were able to work with them and start our efforts to understand what does it mean to do capacity building in these places? I, I so firmly believe that you know, a, a, um, a, an organization saying we know how to build this kind of thing for a community is going to fail every time. Uh, because you need, to under, you need to have local ownership, you need to also understand local context, and there's going to be different assets in every place that you're going to have to leverage if you're going to do this really hard thing and do it well. Uh, so we figured out over two years of a contract what that technical assistance could look like, how to be able to do that work that was both empowering but was not about designing a strategy that sell, sat on a shelf. Because I was bound and determined not to have that be the kind of uh, organization we were running, but one that would actually secure the funding to make those visions a reality. Uh, and so we started uh, that work. Once they had gotten on their path, they became part of the Rural Innovation Network, which is now a community of practice of, of these leaders um, that are all doing similar things and are seeing the power of their aggregated uh, communities uh, in a fascinating way. Uh, we're now up to 33 uh, communities uh, across 24 states uh, and four time zones that are all in the network. Um, we came back to do work in Vermont, thanks to the Vermont Community Foundation, that saw the work that we were doing. Um, and coming out of COVID, they were like, we need a more resilient economy outside of Chitting County. And so paid for us to do work in, in Rutland and Randolph uh, and St. Johnsbury. And we're now, uh, hopefully, knock on wood, uh, awaiting word on some uh, funding uh, opportunities for building out those uh, areas. Um, we also stood up a seed fund uh, that was pretty critical to our work and it was thanks to some instigator friends of mine who said, look, if you're, I, I'd been talking to folks I'd gotten to know who were in the investor community in Silicon Valley and they're like, look, we, we believe you, Matt, that if you say that there are things out there, but we do not have the time to go and, and listen and try to find the companies that would fit across all this stuff, but let's help you set up a seed fund. Let's figure out how you can get an investment vehicle and see if you can prove that these folks are actually out there. And we you know, raised uh, over $4 million. We deployed all of it in a year and a half. And for those of you in venture capital, that is lightning speed into nine extraordinary companies in rural places uh, uh, out of those nine, seven have had up rounds, and one had a down round, but they ended up the year profitable. Um, and so it's, it, it's doing great. And we also launched a, um, a pitch competition called Small Towns Big Ideas, 
which is sort of the, the top um, nascent companies coming out of these network communities. Uh, and th we did the first one last year, and it was, it, it was great. In fact, trying to figure out who was the winner for a $20,000 prize was, was the hardest part. Uh, ended up going to a space junk collection company from Marquette, Michigan, uh, who since then have been able to raise, uh, I think, over $3 million to be able to start actually launching their uh, robotic tools and have an SBIR with NASA. And you know, it was, so, so these are the things that we've been doing. So, um, so we have a couple pieces to our work. We do uh, support um, communities that have yet to get uh, high-speed internet. We have a consulting team. We started doing a little bit of that um, before the pandemic. Turns out it's kind of a thing um, now, and the infrastructure bill that the Biden administration uh, pushed forward uh, could allow our country to have fiber to every home in the nation. It's just, for those of us who have been yelling about it for a long time, this is the moment that we need to be working with communities to make sure that they have the plans in place to be able to execute that well um, to make the best use of the money. So we've got that team. We have a team that's continuing to work with new communities that are wanting to, to join this movement and be a part of building these uh, tech economy ecosystems. Uh, and we're, we're now working with Wasilla, Alaska, two amazing communities in, uh, in Missouri and Torrington, uh, Connecticut. Anyway, it's, it's a, 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 a great group. Uh, and we are, um, and then we have the network. Uh, we had our first um, in-person uh, summit of the communities in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, uh, which by the way, if, if, if you have the chance to go to Cape Girardeau, it is extraordinary. It's right on the Mississippi River. It's on the boot of uh, Missouri, right in that place where like five states come together. And they're crushing it. Uh, they, our, one of our portfolio companies is based there. Someone who grew up there, went away, had a tech and advertising career, and came home to start his company in the place that he loved. Um, so anyway, we've got that, that group. And then we are doing more and more advocacy of, uh, on behalf of rural places to make sure um, that they have a voice and a seat at the table as we're talking about an economic recovery that is um, uh, inclusive. One final piece on that inclusive part uh, is that as we were looking at our map of communities, uh, which were all about folks who were volunteering and saying, yes, please, we want to go, we noticed that there was a big hole uh, that was in the rural southeast. Um, you know, we had Pine Bluff, and we had Wilson, North Carolina, and the Black Belt in between was just missing. Uh, so we were fortunate to be able to raise funding uh, from uh, Land Lakes, Microsoft, and the Ford Foundation. Uh, go figure. We're, we're bringing together some interesting folks uh, to hire a Southeast Regional Director uh, who's from the Delta and is as entrepreneurial as they come. And so we're now starting to do uh, uh, outreach um, and work in some communities that don't have as many of the assets that we tend to look for. Um, but have all the potential in the world, including uh, spent uh, a chunk of last week uh, in Selma, Alabama, um, which has just some amazing new leadership that's trying to uh, rebuild that community. So, Brian. So, can yeah, can you? Oh. Say we have yeah. about 15 minutes left, so yeah. it's a great time to open it up for, for questions. Yeah. And if, when you ask your question, if you can just introduce yourself and who you're with. Sure. So, my name is Ryan Munn. Uh, my day job is with First Light, so I do fiber infrastructure. Um, I'm also in the Black River Innovation Campus Fall Actuator with Interchain Live, a startup that oh, I'm great. working with. Um, so my question is more of a, a couple points that I, th I think you can weave together about rural innovation. And the so the pandemic has driven people to Vermont, which has been an ongoing problem, the decline of population in Vermont. But we still have this challenge of how to get kids to want to stay here or come back after college. Yeah. And I'm hoping you can speak a little bit to the non-college track or non-traditional college track. Kids can take college courses online from anywhere. They can do an accelerated four-year you know, course in two years. Um, but the, the miss or the misconception is still investors and where they want to place their money and how they value the credentials of the people speaking. And so what I'm hoping you might be able to talk about, especially if there's a success story, is how getting venture capital, money and attention on high school pitch competitions mm. and how that can influence the challenge we have in Vermont of closing elementary schools, right? If we show a path mm -hmm. for these elementary schools where the value isn't in do we have enough money per kid in the school, it's we have this 
local resource, we can cultivate innovative thinking and creative applications of STEM and development and co-work space usage of these facilities. And how does it all come together, right? For venture capital and public funding to see that the money starts at five years old. Yep. And that's what leads to communities that adhere, whether they're local or at a distance. Uh, so Ryan, as usual, you're combining three different really important subjects together, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, let, let, me, let me address a, a couple of them. One is the, uh, the pathways in general, um, because technology and coding uh, actually has been proven to be a medium that you do not need to be adept in traditional academic environments to completely thrive and succeed. And, and there's been just you know, case study after case study, mostly urban, uh, where you know, tech boot camps and coding boot camps and other kinds of things, it's not for everyone, but is for folks who actually have those synapses that go in that direction, young people from all backgrounds and all races uh, and all genders can be incredibly uh, successful. And it's one of those things that uh, we're, we're super excited about. The challenge is that most of the boot camp structures, even when they think about it online, which is strange, want a uh, large number of hiring partners proximate. So they were, they're like, okay, we'll do that, but only if you can identify 10,000 open recs for that position nearby. And we're like, across the whole network, right? We've got 2.2 million people now in the overall network, and there are a bunch of employers, um, but it would be hard to do that. The other side is on, on the demand side, which is that many of the non-tech tech employers, meaning manufacturers and hospitals and others that need tech talent, have basically given up on rural places and they're all outsourcing their uh, tech work out of Brooklyn and, and San Francisco, um, which doesn't make any sense. They're paying like 6x, but when you ask them, they say, oh, I assume there wasn't anyone here who could do those jobs. So there, we did an analysis recently that showed that there's 80,000 missing tech jobs right now in rural places. And that if we just close that gap, it would make a huge difference in, in bridging. So that's just one piece that we're, we're trying to fix to make sure that there is a view that you can have that pathway regardless of your educational trajectory ahead of time. Um, the second is where venture capital goes. Uh, and we have a, some, some wonderful examples of people who had lived experiences and now become successful tech entrepreneurs. The one I'll use is Shift Auto. Uh, which is based in Wilson, North Carolina. This was founded by a guy who was a auto repair person um, and managed an auto repair shop and discovered it, I know this is shocking, it's a miserable experience to be a customer at most auto repair shops, right? You have no idea when your car is going to be ready, whether there's a loaner car, what, you know, they call you randomly in the middle of your meeting to say, do you want me to do this or do that? when you can't answer and then you can't get a hold of them. So created this platform to allow for that experience. You can probably identify um, yeah. what, to actually bridge that. And many people were like, has this already been solved? Well, apparently not. And his lived work experience combined with finding a technologist who he just bonded with has allowed them to create this platform. It was a, an investment from our seed fund uh, and they just had a, a $4 million round. And so they are growing and expanding, um, all from Wilson, North Carolina, which was the uh, tobacco uh, auction capital of, of uh, that region of the, the South, um, but is now recreating itself as a, as a tech hub. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's an example. And I, I think you're right that there were people who were not necessarily taking him seriously at first until they really were. And I think we need to be continuing to push um, that narrative. The final piece is on youth um, and, and the trajectory for youth. And I do think that high school uh, pitch competitions are, are really interesting and dynamic ways to get folks involved. But I'll, I'll just go back to, uh, well, we, we work really hard to incorporate uh, youth coding 
and other kinds of activity into our work and invite folks into those, and encourage people to invite folks into those spaces. Uh, Cape Girardeau actually launched a youth coding league because they were like, well, we need more pipeline from this area to, to, to support it. Um, and they, they've now started including uh, Springfield and Red Wing, Minnesota in the Youth Coding League. They're now up to 100 schools that are all participating in this thing. Again, virtually but through the network in a pretty powerful way. Uh, but it comes, you know, uh, Marion Wright Edelman said, uh, it's hard to be what you can't see. And it's absolutely true. And as we're trying to change the narrative about tech jobs and tech employment, um, that it's not just for white dudes and hoodies, um, you have to be actually representing, uh, including in rural. And when people in a high school start seeing a cool space where tech and creative activities are happening and people are thriving in them, their likelihood of saying, you know what, I want to stay here or I want to come back here goes way up. Um, and and uh, otherwise, you could just get that, um, I'm, I'm going to leave as soon as I can. And that the only people who are left are those that are stuck. So anyway, Ryan, you, you kicked off three important topics. Um, hopefully that helped. Yeah. Um, I yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm asking the right questions. Yeah. But I'm curious, I've come across situations in, where it's obvious that a, a, an investment in tech would solve a problem for an industry, mm -hmm. um, but it might be a very finite problem that doesn't have tons of revenue potential, right? Mm -hmm. It solves a problem for a very specific strata of people, strata of the industry. Yep. How? even if there isn't you know, a, a billion dollar unicorn at the end of the tunnel. Because yeah. um, I think there, there are tons of problems in, in my nonprofit experience that we could solve totally. with tech, but there's a reluctance in nonprofits to spend the money there. Yep. And yep. so finding that, yeah. Can you talk about Yeah, that? no, so we, we, we talk a bit about how, you know, a $10 million exit is a lot of money, right? And it's particularly a lot of money in a, in a rural place. And, and there is a fallacy uh, about even Silicon Valley that the only plays that investors do are in billion dollar potentials. There is lots and lots of investment that go into small, they, they call them you know, base hits. $10 million base hits sounds like a big base hit. But anyway, it, but they talk about um, actually doing investment. And it's lower profile folks. It's not the Greylocks. It's not the Draper, Richard Kaplan. I mean, it's, it's, it is uh, uh, other tier investors. And sometimes it's folks from industry. Uh, so a number of the accelerators that have started to be stood up in rural places might be underwritten by Stryker, right? Which is a, uh, they, they do... Uh, medical devices. And they're wanting to do it because they want to have first look at new ideas that they can't find internally, even though they have a whole internal entrepreneurship thing. They would love to be able to see the next thing that's coming out that could solve that little bit of a problem um, to do a relatively low cost acquisition and allow that entrepreneur to be able to get resources that they can then go and, and use uh, elsewhere. And so we've seen Red Wing, Minnesota, there was a nonprofit um, that started a, I would call it a social media combined with finance literacy combined with savings program, that yeah. they had an exit. Uh, they, they sold it to a, a very large, I think, I think it was right, a very large credit union. Huh. And they were like, huh, oh, that, that worked. Um, very, very helpful. Uh, and, and, and we're seeing, uh, there's, there's uh, an individual who uh, is a professor at Northern Vermont <laughs> University, or I guess Vermont, whatever it's called now, um, who was a weather expert and worked with a lot of big data. And he had a lovely exit just recently in Linden, Vermont. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good so uh, it's, <laughs> these things are, they're happening, right? And so I guess the, um, and, and, and our, uh, our seed fund is, is certainly looking for market rate returns for a seed fund. We, we think we can do that. We don't think we have to compromise at all 
even while we're doing mission-oriented work. By the way, we, we have mostly LP, so you know, individuals who are investing in it, um, but at the, at the end, if it's successful, half of the carry comes back to the Center on Rural Innovation to help advance our work. And we see that as, I mean, it's going to be a long-term return. We're not counting on it anytime soon. But in many ways, that's one of the exciting parts of the social enterprise is all of that is aligned, right? If that community's companies are successful, then the fund is successful, then we're able to get more revenue to work with more communities or that community to be able to expand and, and grow. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a long answer to your question, but there are investors out there that are willing to do it. Um, and we've been trying to aggregate those either through the fund or through any other players. We don't see the fund as competitive. We're like, please, compete with our fund. Come, let, or let's do a round together so that we can all be a part of uh, building that, that kind of entity out. Uh, VSET, um, which is based in Burlington, is trying to do more investment uh, around the whole state, not just in the Chittenden County area. Uh, and we're going to be, uh, knock on wood, also receiving an allocation from a new treasury program um, to, f to provide early stage tw $25,000 to $50,000 checks um, for folks coming out of an accelerator program um, to be able to get their idea to that next uh, level. Um, so that, that would probably kick off uh, in the first quarter of, of next year. And that's for er early stage, um, uh, not the later stage companies that we tend to look for for the seed fund. But it's a great question because yeah. yeah. there's, we'll there's there. and lots then of And I think um, after this question, let's, um, we'll just kind of break up and we can mm -hmm. talk more casually if anybody wants to. Sure. Things, yeah. Uh, Chico Eastridge, Ooh, I Chico. work here. Um, <laughs> what are some uh, perils of re revitalization or things that you've seen that you wish uh, maybe could have been done differently? Uh, so I, I think the, the perils of revitalization is, are, are twofold. One is, uh, is over concentration of who the developers are and how committed they are to that location. Uh, and the other is um, uh, over-indexing to one kind of housing or another. And I, I, and I, and I say that carefully because uh, in some places when revitalization happens, you don't keep up with affordable housing. Um, but in, in those same moments, uh, there is only one type of affordable housing that folks are willing to then do. And so you end up with an even broader bifurcation. So if the only subsidy that's available is for uh, low-income housing, which it needs to be there for, right? And there is lots and lots of opportunity to do that. But if there's nothing for that middle band, you end up with super high-end and you end up with super low-end and you you end up with the same kind of stratification um, that we're, you know, trying not, we're, we're trying to address in general with our work. Um, and so I would say that's, that's the other uh, challenge. But you look at, I mean, Durham, North Carolina has been going through, it's a city, but it's been going through revitalization, but it's been in many ways done to the community as opposed to by and, and with the community. Um, and I think they're now having to like back way up and figure out what does that mean and what does that equity uh, piece look like. Um, I think in some ways, even though it's not been perfect, that White River's done it pretty well. And there may be some folks who differ in that view uh, in, in White River, but you, and, and a lot of this I have to say is because Twin Pines I think is a superb organization and I will argue with anyone who thinks otherwise um, because they, Andrew saw uh, the, um, the rise of White River coming and started like <laughs> ringing the bell and saying we need to make sure that we've got inventory of buildings and we need to be ahead of the curve in trying to secure resources for things like the uh, development that he was able to drive up on Sykes Avenue which is not just for 
low-income folks, it's workforce housing as well as other things, as well as making sure that in the downtown itself, there is mixed housing. Is it enough? No. But there is, it is much better than many communities that didn't address that at all and didn't do any of that investment, and it went from uh, being a place that was you know, not for people in higher incomes to only being for people in higher incomes, and that creates all kinds of other dislocation uh, and challenges with it. So those are, those are the things that I've, I've observed. I, I cannot tell you that there is an exact uh, playbook um, to solve for that. Uh, and I do, it, it does drive me a little bit crazy having, um, uh, when, when people say, oh, all of that economic renewal in White River is damaging and terrible. Um, because having been here in 1992, uh, when we dreamed of having a parking problem, we said, please, can we have a parking problem? Uh, because there was no one doing investment here. Everything was being uh, disinvested. The whole, you know, anything that was left here was very extractive. Um, that we've gotten to the place where we have that kind of positive momentum, where people can have locally owned restaurants and, uh, and activities and institutions that are both nonprofit and for-profit that are uh, growing and scaling, that you can redevelop and infill uh, brownfields into uh, office spa mixed use spaces that can allow people to actually live here and, and walk, right? I mean, this is, this is a walkable community in a really interesting way that um, many communities uh, throughout the country are, are just simply not. So that's, that would be my take, uh, and I, I, um, and it's one that we think about a lot. In fact, my team keeps yelling at me about how we need to do housing, and we need to do uh, hospital strategic planning, and we need to figure out how to solve for the K-12 systems in, one, in places where folks with means have all taken their kids out of the public school systems and all. And, and I have said, we can find partners for that, but if we try to solve all of the things, we will fail. Uh, we to agree. So there we are. To, to Thank you so much, yes. Matt. I really appreciate you coming. And then you know, come grab coffee if anybody wants to chat afterwards. So thank you so much. Thank you all for coming out. And I just want to ask if everybody would sign our guest book. Um, and I think you're probably on Marion's list, if not on ours also. But if you're, but if you're not on there, your, yeah. if you're not on there, you'll also leave your email address so we can with you. Um, but yeah, hang out here. This is uh, exactly the kind of community. What was the? Um, virtuous collisions. Virtuous, virtuous collisions. collisions. That's so this that's, is your job yeah. now is to virtually collide virtually in the next collide. couple minutes yeah. and come back and collide off. <laughs> that, that was great. Oh, <laughs>